Question or observation? What occurred during the Jotun incident between the Coastal Guardians and the five escaped subjects of the Jotun experiment? This is a compilation of data leading both up to the incident and during the incident. Research topic area. The Coastal Guardians are an extension of Isle City Vanguard. The Vanguard is an international confederation of emergency services merged into one organization. Emergency medical technicians, firefighters, emergency management, reconstruction services, disaster, debris, disinfectant, and numerous other emergency services. Essentially, any emergency service that isn't military or police services are offered by the Vanguard. One of the enduring rules of the Vanguard is that no full-time employees of Vanguard are allowed to be exomy nor esoteric. This requirement was insisted upon by the Empire of the Seven Cities during the creation of the Vanguard by the League of Nations. All employees of Vanguard are required to be exoteric individuals. However, some sub-organizations are contracted with the Vanguard to provide exomy or esoteric consultants during disasters. This allows the Vanguard to take advantage of these extraordinary abilities without technically employing the people who have them. The Coastal Guardians is one such organization. A total of 81 individuals who work for the Isle City Governor 79 of the individuals are exoteric and have no known special abilities. The two with unique abilities are codenamed Hush and Birthstone. Information about these two's origins are sparse to the MSU, but this is what is known along with their known abilities. Hush was found when destroying the monstrous Mas Master Monday. She was believed to be exoteric before her sudden, uncontrolled birth and awakening of exome abilities. Now Hush stands at 24.484 meters tall and weighs 113 metric tons, approximately the same size and weight as a blue whale. Even considering her size, her strength, durability, speed, and power is in the upper tiers of exome. Her maximum limits are not known, but she has been seen outrunning the speed of sound, lifting half a skyscraper, and her skin has yet to be penetrated by any clandestine test MSU spies have attempted. Her personality has been described as confident, unrelenting, and unstoppable. Her mindset has proven to be very successful at thinking tactically. However, she appears to struggle when thinking strategically or logistically. Her actions and word choice has led MSU analysts to believe that she didn't live an educated life, and she likely was an athlete before her abilities awakened. She has no known weaknesses, but it is hypothesized that she may be vulnerable to gas-based poisons, poor balance, or manipulations. These have not been tested as of writing. She has several personal relationships with the members of the Coastal Guardians, but excluding that, she has no known friendships nor point of social contact. It is hypothesized that she is attempting to maintain a distance from others for emotional protection, but it is unknown if it is for herself or for others. Possible weakness if this can be further examined. Birthstone has an even more difficult origin to understand. She was simply said to be a friend of Hush's and joined the Coastal Guardians two weeks after the formation of the Coastal Guardians. She has an esoteric ability to change her size at will. Normally, at a centimeter tall, Birthstone is required to be at her minimum size for an extended period of time to be at the larger sizes. For example, she will need to spend 24 hours at a centimeter tall to spend a single minute at 18.3 meters tall. Her maximum height is 18.3 meters with a weight of 117.58 metric tons. 
greater mass than Hush, despite being much shorter. Her esoteric ability has proven to be a massive drawback that is her greatest weakness. Even being a functional size, like one meter tall, still requires a significant amount of time at one centimeter tall. So she often spends time at minimal size, providing an advisory role unless combat is absolutely necessary. However, she has proven to be an extraordinarily strategically and logistically minded individual, so even at one centimeter tall, she has already killed three different spies sent to capture her. Her word choice and technical expertise indicate she comes from a very well-educated background with many resources. Her personality has been described as quiet, withdrawn, morose, and sad. She is dependent on the other members of the Coastal Guardians for most of her needs and wants. It is believed that she may be developing an inferiority complex that may be exploitable in the future. Even with the work of these Coastal Guardians, there were five escaped subjects from the Jotun experiment, simply called Jotun, for simplicity's sake. The five Jotun were created from an experiment involving horizontal gene transfer from Birthstone's DNA that allowed for her immense growth and ability to survive the size to be transferred to five exoteric humans. At the end of the 120-day-long experiment, they escaped the facility and consumed all of the scientists on site. Each Jotun needs to consume the same amount of calories as 20,000 humans each day to maintain their size and power. So it is believed that they turn to cannibalism to consume the necessary calories they need. It has been confirmed that three of the Jotun are pregnant, so it has become a critical need to capture the Jotun as quickly as possible. However, no forces that report to the Mad Scientist Union are sufficient to capture the Jotun. Due to the extreme nature of the escaped subjects, the leakage of information, and insufficient MSC resources, diplomats within Isle City negotiated for the detainment of the Jotun. So, Isle City Governor activated the Coastal Guardians to have them aid in the capture of the Jotun. At this time, the Jotun have caused approximately 50,000 aura and damages to local crop yields. So, Isle City government is quite invested in capturing or killing the test subjects. Death is a less preferred method for the test subjects, but we can still learn a lot from the corpses. Letting them escape is unacceptable. Hypothesis the Coastal Guardians, primarily Hush, should have the necessary power to put down the five half-starved lab experiments. Test or Experiment When the midnight call came, it was a lot closer to 5 a.m. than midnight. I was still in my hammock when my phone rang, and grumpily, I grabbed at my phone. My hand slammed a few times at the side table, causing the building to shake, until I grabbed the phone. Hello, I asked sleepily, and I heard the familiar voice of the Vanguard representative. Technically, their full title was Vanguard representative to those with extraordinary abilities, but just representative for short. They weren't technically my boss, but they represented my boss, so for all intents and purposes, they were in charge. We need all of the Coastal Guardians active for this. We have five giant humans stealing crop from the Lionfish District. We need them either detained or dead. The damage to the food supply has already been severe, and if it escalates any further, military will be pulled from the Tejas front and deployed. Location has been sent to your team leader. You are expected to deploy in five minutes. The representative said before hanging up. No further information given, no questions asked. Not that I mind too much. I tend to enjoy keeping my mind on my the performance, and so much of what the representative said was only noise. 
Birthstone would take the information and she would tell me where I would need to go and what I need it to do. I appreciate the fact that she was straightforward with me when the vanguard was usually dodgy. I got myself out from the hammock and I stretched my hands, almost brushing the ceiling. My room was less of a room and more of a modified section of an aircraft hangar blocked off with steel siding. The hammock was made from very thick steel cables that were designed for pulling ships. They were covered in canvas to make it a bit softer on my skin, and the hammock itself hung from two steel girders, reinforced with concrete deep in the foundation of the earth. Even so, I had to be careful not to pull too hard on them to risk breaking them. My bathroom was pretty sparse. A toilet, a sink in my scale, a mirror that was barely big enough to see my face and hair, and forget about any beauty products of my size. Birthstone did the calculations for me once. I would have to buy 72 pallets of eyeshadow just to cover one eye. And makeup companies don't give government discounts nor superhero discounts, I asked. My shower was my one place of luxury in an otherwise bleak room. A converted riot hose was my shower head with soap, shampoo, and conditioner kept in converted oil drums that each held 200 liters. Otherwise, my room held almost nothing. I only had a few outfits, each made out of an extremely durable fabric that could stretch and twist without breaking, not even to my own strength. I didn't know all of the specifics, but I do know that thinner versions of it were used in bullet-resistant armor and firefighters' uniforms. My own fabric was built to allow me to have pockets for my team to strap themselves in while I was running, since I was the primary transportation for the Coastal Guardians. But due to the price of the fabric, I only had a few outfits at a time. Still, though, due to the risk involved, as I got my shoes and socks on, I also grabbed my trident. My trident was my first trophy from defeating Master Monday. His weapon was now my weapon. A trident longer than I was tall, carved from a single bone of a massive sea creature. The only weapon I had in my size. I tried a few others, but none of them survived very long in my hands. The trident, on the other hand, still worked great without any problems at all. I didn't bring it on most missions, since most missions didn't even require fighting, so carrying a 25 meter long trident was usually a bad idea. But violent giants meant that it was needed. I strapped it to my back with a belt made for it. Now prepared, I left my room, closing the sliding siding doors, and made it to the main meeting area. Here, there were platforms for the rest of the Coastal Guardians to stand on for me to put them into my pockets. Here was where we met. Birthstone would be in her own pocket with the head of the Tippecam Coastal Guardians. Daisy Dyson our team leader. Daisy was dressed in black armor with a trident in a heater shape, a bold statement proclaiming her to be a hero. Birthstone and I had similar ones on our outfits. By having a positive symbol that people associate with heroism, we made ourselves approachable to anyone who may be in danger and to any possible enemies. It lets them recognize us even from a distance, which could intimidate some enemies, but others take it as a challenge. Having a shield on my chest didn't just mean taking blows, but also being able to withstand them. But being almost 25 meters tall and more powerful than a train meant very little could actually hurt me. Daisy and Birthstone strapped in my pocket, I prepared for my run to the Lionfish District. Fort Zipakna, where we lived and met, 
was on its own tiny island in Isle City. Isle City, despite the name, was made up of a series of islands connected by bridges, roads, and boats. The Lionfish District was a little over 50 kilometers to the northeast on a peninsula. It was famous for growing most of the oranges on the continent of Vespucci. Along with being a famous stop for hunting the lionfish that gave the district its name. Lionfish were an invasive species and hunting them was heavily encouraged and could be done without a license. However, the oranges were the real money makers of the district. From what Birthstone was telling me in my earpiece, that the orange groves were being stripped, the grocery stores robbed, and the cannery lost most of its fish. So the giants were believed to be hungry and seeking food. But with our five minutes up, it was now time for us to, de to deploy. I got into my ready position, while Birthstone confirmed the path was going to be clear. Lionfish District was 50 kilometers away. The giants were last seen taking fish from the cannery. The road had to be cleared before I could start running. I could try to run around cars, but it was a lot more difficult, and it would slow me down, which was something no one wanted at all. When it was confirmed that the way was clear, I took a deep breath and I ran into the pre-dawn morning. The lights only came up to my hips, but I was still careful to try and run down the middle of the street, with my eyes cast forward to make sure there was nothing for me to trip on or step on. The way was clear, so I ran forward and felt the wind push against me harder and harder as I pushed further and further until with a loud boom, I broke through the sound barrier. I could still feel the wind and hear it pass through me, but otherwise the night was quiet and I felt my heart beat strongly in my chest. It was like being on the stage again. All the power in the world at my fingertips and all under my control. The world slowed around me and it was quiet, peaceful. In moments like this, I felt like I was the only person in the world. No problems could catch up to me. There was just the road beneath my shoes, the wind against my face, and my heart in my chest. A peace I didn't get to experience often enough. There wasn't anywhere I could just let myself run without restraint. And every time I ran to get somewhere quickly, I was always there too quickly. 50 kilometers for me running like this, even though it wasn't as fast as I could sprint, it was still far too quick. At my speed, 50 kilometers passed in less than three minutes. Now near the end of my destination, I planted my feet hard on the highway and pushed against the sudden rush of air pushing me forward. Stopping suddenly meant I also had to counter my own momentum. Sure enough, in the early pre-dawn light, I saw something unusual at the cannery. One of the brick walls was knocked down, and I could see two giant men crouched down, digging through the rubble. Both were nearly naked, wearing large canvas, crudely fashioned into tunics. They both had long hair and beards. One had red hair, and the other had dark hair. But it was their eyes that was the most unsettling part. They had the eyes of someone who was haunted over and over again. Someone who had seen many terrible things and had done many terrible things. A deep hunger was in their eyes. One that said that they were starving and no matter how much they ate, they would always be starving. Something I remember seeing in the Sunset District, in the eyes of the truly desperate who lived their entire lives on the street. 
It was sad and terrifying, even if, and if I stood six meters taller than the both of them. Still, I had to give them a fair chance. Greetings, I said, and they kept staring at me. So I continued my script. My name is Hush. I represent the Coastal Guardians. We understand that you are hungry and we can get you food, but you cannot steal it. That perked them up a bit. Food? The red-haired giant asked, and I nodded. Yes, food. We have food for you in the nearby Grove District. If you can just tell us where the other three are, we can help. I didn't even finish my sentence before they both rushed towards me. I lifted my arms to keep them from getting too close, but clearly they were out for my blood. You won't touch them, the red-haired giant said, and I braced my feet. I punched directly into his gut before doing the same to the dark-haired giant, having them both on the ground gasping for air. I took the chance to take Daisy out of my pocket. She would get to a distance, and Birthstone would offer tactical advice from what could be seen. Okay, fine. I won't touch them, but they still need to come with us. I told the giants, only to be tackled to the ground. This time, I was actually knocked down. No! The red-haired giant yelled as he started flailing at my face and chest with his fists while his friend kicked and stomped at my chest and hands. Protecting my face, I pushed up against them both and knocked them down. They clearly weren't used to their size nor fighting if they he fell over so easily. Still, though, there was a lot of power in their strikes. I lifted my hand to my lips and withdrew it, showing my own blood. I haven't been cut nor bruised in years. I wasn't used to seeing myself bleed and the pain. I actually felt hurt. Throughout all the years since my powers awakened, pain was someone I hadn't felt in a long time. Even when Master Monday was drowning me, I didn't feel pain. But with my blood on my hand, something changed in me. I refused to be hurt anymore. And if these two insisted on trying to hurt me, I would hurt them so much harder than they could ever hurt me. I withdrew my trident from the belt on my back, and I pointed it towards the two giants on the ground. One spat out blood, and the other spat out a tooth. I will give you one last chance. Surrender, or else. I said, balancing my trident pole on my arm, ready to stab at them both. They didn't choose to surrender. They both stood just outside the range, making feints towards me as I stood and waited for them to get close. Hush, can you hear me? Birthstone asked through my earpiece, and I responded, Confirmed. Any suggestions? Don't kill them. They're almost feral, so think tactically. Don't try to overwhelm them with strength, otherwise they'll both try to attack you at the same time. See if you can draw them to the beach. Maybe you can get water or sand in their eyes. We still have to find the other three. She told me, and I nodded. The beach was behind both of the giants and I wasn't sure how to push them forward, unless I took a step forward and they both took a step back. They wanted to keep their distance. I could take them there, one step at a time. I took another step and they backed up further. They stood on the beach while I didn't. One more step would be all it took. I took another step forward, but this time they didn't back up. They lunged for my trident. The red-haired giant grabbed the trident with his hand. The sharp tine stabbed into his hand, and he still grabbed at it, trying to pull it out of my hand. 
and his dark-haired friend ran at me, leading with his teeth. I punched the dark-haired giant in his throat, and he doubled over, coughing and hacking. If he was lucky, he just had a bruised trachea. Still, as he fell, and the red-haired giant saw that, he did something I didn't expect. Help! He bellowed as his voice echoed past the trees and the hills. I didn't know who he was calling for help, but I had to end this. His hand still stuck in my trident. I pushed him down and kicked him in the face, knocking him down to the ground. Now, where are the other giants? I asked the red-haired giant. He looked up at me with desperation in his eyes. He wasn't being defiant. He was too far gone for defiance. He still stared at me with hunger. Even as I lifted the trident to his eyes, he stared pat at me. Asked the trident. Where are they? I asked him. Behind you, Birthstone called out just in time for me to be knocked to the ground. My trident fell out of my hand as I rolled into the sand, and I turned to face my new attackers. Three women, just as large as the men, barely 18 meters tall. One had the remnants of blue dyed hair. Another was blonde, and the final one had extremely short brown hair. Even if they had me by surprise, I took on kaiju and leviathans. I highly doubted that three new starving giants were going to change the odds that much. At least until I saw their swollen stomachs. I felt a shiver run up my spine, and despite myself... I felt myself freeze. This, this couldn't be happening. I knew I had to keep fighting. I knew if I didn't take them out, that they would take me out. But I couldn't bring myself to strike at them. I couldn't pick up my trident. I couldn't even throw sand at them. The only thing I could do was try to cover my face and neck as the women started wailing on me. The women were all pregnant. I could hear Birthstone squawking in my ear. She kept trying to offer tactical advice, telling me to protect myself, to hit back, to do anything to change the fight, so I wasn't being stomped on by angry giants, but I couldn't. I couldn't attack them, even as more blood was drawn, and bruises blossomed from my ribs, and I felt like I was going to die. I still couldn't hurt them. Look out! Birthstone screamed out of desperation. I looked up only to see the giant with the blue hair pick up a large rock and bring it down. I heard the crack in my skull before I felt the pain. As I was falling, the only thing I could think while falling into the darkness was that Birthstone was going to be so mad at me. When I saw Hush fall, I realized why she refused to stop fighting. She didn't want to hurt the women, but clearly they had no such qualms about hurting her. Immediately after she was knocked out, they began to drag her away, back where they came from. I could see the traces of blood and bone from under their fingernails, and I knew they were cannibals. If I didn't stop them here, we wouldn't get another chance. Set me down, Daisy. It's my turn. I told her, and she put me down on the ground and I pulled out my Rethin device. My great weakness and my greatest strength. Something I tried to learn more about and something I could never trust to anyone else. My greatest fear and my greatest hope. I set my size to maximum and I ran forward with all of my strength before pushing the button that allowed my size to change. 
sprint rapidly turned me from unnoticeable to the same size as Hush's attackers. I ran into them, breaking their grip, and I turned to face them. Hush was bleeding on the ground behind me, and her, her blood smeared across my clothes and face as I turned to face the hungry giants. I knew I had very little chance of beating them in a fight. Even though they were starving, I wasn't nearly as powerful as Hush, and they already took her out. I was the same size, so it was more of a fair fight. Except I wasn't much of a fighter, but I was determined not to let my friend get hurt. My The two male giants were still out of the fight, but the pregnant giants stared me down with hunger, as I knew they were planning to eat me. With how much food they needed to eat, they probably turned to cannibalism for the necessary calories. And being the same size as me, they needed a lot of calories. Still, as I faced them, waiting for them to attack, an odd question occurred to me. Were they the same weight as me? They were probably lighter than me, even considering pregnancy. Judging by the starved looks of their bodies and the fact that I had a higher than average BMI. So, even though we were the same height, we definitely were not the same mass. Wait, that was the answer. I eyed the giants and waited for my chance. There was a little rule with the Rethin device. Something that was convenient for the most part but sometimes it offered strategic advantage, if I could use it properly. I adjusted the size on the Rethin device, and I waited for them to wait, make their move. Sure enough, after a few seconds, they all lunged at me, and I dove forward, crashing them all against the ground, and I made sure I was holding them all, as I pushed the button to change my size to a more manageable one meter tall. The Rethin device was linked to me. Even if it is handled by someone else, it changes my size and the size of any object touching me, as long as the object has mass that is less than my own. That was how I was able to keep my clothes on, whether I was 18 meters tall or one centimeter short. So, if I had to say, lay on three giants who were just as tall as I was, but a lot lighter than me, that had a lot less mass, exactly what I could affect. Sure enough, they all shrank with me until they were a meter tall and stunned from the fall. Now at that size, I quickly adjusted my size to five meters tall and held them down while I called Daisy over. All five test subjects have been detained, and we will need medical care for all of them and for Hush. I turned to where she laid. She was still knocked out, but finally her bleeding stopped as her wounds were finally clotted. Medical care for her was going to be tricky, but I was finally relieved that the problem was finally over. Analyze data. We will need to reevaluate Birthstone's abilities. It was believed only Hush was a threat, but now that we know Birthstone's strategic abilities make her a greater threat. The returned Jotun have been a great subject of study. The males have been vivisected, and we have learned a lot about the Jotun's adapted biology. It is believed that extended starvation has caused the brain to become starved of nutrients, and hence the loss of apparent intelligence. The smaller subjects have also been studied. Even at the reduced size, they consume far more calories than should be needed at their size. Their organs appear to be adjusted, just like the larger subjects. They will be allowed to give birth, but multi-generational study will be required for these subjects. Replicate observation. There is much 
that we do not understand about Birthstone's esoteric abilities. It was her blood that allowed us to create the Yotun, and it was her ability that rendered the Yotun human-sized again. We likely cannot replicate the ability of her Rethan device. However, we may have more to uncover with her help, whether she knows or not. Birthstone is to be observed by Agent Dyson, and tactical assessments will continue. If we get a chance to capture her, take it. <laughs>